today we're talking about a battle that goes on every single day. It's the battle for the mind. Every day there is a battle raging for our mind. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which implies that if we renew our mind, we ourselves will be transformed. It is Yes, there is a spiritual transformation when we're born again. But for the most part, people remain the same after being born again in their natural man. Yes, I know the old man is dead. I know that. But what we're talking about is the same old way of thinking. However, if we respond to Romans and renew our mind and work on renewing our mind, we will have transformed lives. Isaiah chapter 26, you don't need to turn to this. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. Amen. Now, how many people do you know today are in perfect peace? Mm. All around us, people are in turmoil. Mental turmoil, emotional turmoil, physical turmoil, financial turmoil, relationship turmoil. Mm. Multi-billion dollar industries in our nation and the world. Life coach. Uh, yeah, sometimes spiritual coach, but that's what a pastor is supposed to be, a spiritual coach. Right. Mostly it's the world that needs a coach because they don't go to church. So they have a life coach. Or they have the, uh, the entire industry of positive thinking. And what is that all about? A multi-billion dollar industry, it's all about trying to get the mind under control. There's a battle raging. The enemy knows this. And so I want to look at three areas of battle. There's three battlefields in our mind. There's probably more, but I'm going to look at three today. Three battlefields. You know, and during World War II, there was the Pacific Theater, and that was fought mostly by the Navy, other than MacArthur, who had an army there from the Philippines. And then there was the European Theater and the North African Theater. That was fought mostly by the Army. And the, at that time, the Air Force was the Army Air Corps. Also, the Marines fought in the Pacific. But you had a division because you had multiple battlefields going on at the same time. And sometimes it's interesting to see the simultaneous battles halfway around the world that were taking place. But same with our mind. There are multiple battlefields that we are engaging on a daily basis. We're going to look at three today. The first one is the area of sin and temptation. Sin and temptation. This is the first and the most common, and it does not stop just because we're born again. And in the area of sin and temptation, it's uh, most combat is within. You know, a lot of times we talk about the weapons of our warfare and we tear down strongholds. Most of the combat is within us. And that's what we want to look at. And in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the enemy says, Yea, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The first area of battle is sin and temptation through doubt and suggestion. Doubt and suggestion. The enemy comes and sows a doubt. Has the Lord really said that? Yeah. Has the Lord really said that? Does the Bible really mean that? There are people today who stretch the meaning of the Bible to make it fit whatever their lifestyle is rather than changing their lifestyle to fit into the Bible. We have things today that are cults, but uh, some people consider them religions. Mormons, for example, that believe in you know, multiple wives. We have uh, others that believe that they are Israel, that the Jewish people no longer have anything to do in the covenant that they're Israel. Many, many different ways of trying to adjust the Bible to fit personal circumstances of life. And yet, what I read is that we are to change because God's word does not change. And so the first area of battle, sin and temptation, is through suggestion and doubt. He goes on to say, after Eve says, no, no, that's not what the Lord said. He says, you shall surely not die. Now, this is a direct contradiction of God himself. He begins with sowing a doubt, doesn't come right out and, and say it 
from the beginning, doesn't confront God's word in the beginning, sows a doubt about God's word. And then the next step is to absolutely confront the word of God and say, that is not true. That's not what it means. That's where most people outside of the church are today. They're in that place where they do not believe that God's word is from God, that the Bible is true or has any bearing on our lives. And then he follows it up again by making a false promise. You shall be as God. You shall be. Now, what does that mean to be as God? Because today, you know, we know there's God. But in, in that time period, you shall be as gods. In other words, you determine your own purpose and your own direction. You are self-governing. What you say goes. What you say is fact. And everybody else needs to understand that what you feel you are, they have to obey that. Doesn't that sound a bit like today's society? That people get bent out of shape if a man comes out of the ladies' room and you confront them and say, you're a man, you don't need to be in that ladies' room. And they say, no, you must call me by my pronouns. And because they think they're that, we're supposed to think they're that and believe that? See, that is, you shall be gods. It doesn't matter that he created the male and female. You shall be gods. And call yourself whatever you want yourself to be. And make sure everybody else obeys that or they get in trouble themselves. You shall be as gods. First battle that we go through is the area of sin and temptation. Jesus redeemed us from that. Set us free from that curse. Forgave us by the blood of the Lamb. And we need to continually spend time repenting from even the slightest doubt. That doesn't mean that we're on our knees 24-7 repenting, oh, woe is me. When we begin to doubt, we starve that doubt by feeding our faith on the Word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by His Word. We are not to entertain doubts. We uproot them and not allow them to bring forth fruit in our lives. The second area, and I'm going to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. The second area of battle is weakness and inability. Weakness and inability. People feel that they just don't measure up. People are searching for identity. People want to be recognized. And so they go to extreme lengths in order for people to recognize them, to acknowledge them because of personal feelings of weakness and inability. Unable to achieve in life. Unable to be important. Unable to accomplish goals that were set. And feeling vulnerable as a result. Feeling that there's no way, but it's not my fault. It's because I am African American. It's because I am Asian. It's because I am Hispanic that I don't get what I should, what's, what I deserve, what's rightly mine. And there's nothing I can do about it. Feelings of weakness. Feelings that everybody owes us something. And with that feeling also comes self-centeredness. Because we judge everyone and everything through the prism of self. What is that going to do for me? What are they going to do for me? What do they owe me? What should they do for me? So it's with that prism of self, but it comes from weakness and feelings of inability. This is a, this is a lie of the devil. Because no matter whether someone comes from an African-American background, an Hispanic background, an Asian background, an Anglo background, doesn't matter what the background, every one of us have gifts and talents from God unless we are taught by the enemy to suppress them and not use them, not develop them. And in first, uh, second Timothy, sorry, second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. We cannot be afraid of failure. We must banish fear. Fear that we're not good enough. Fear that we don't measure up. Fear that we've got to change ourselves to be accepted by others. We have been created by the Lord to be who we are. 
and he has given us a sound and stable mind. But it's up to us to develop that mind through the love of God. He says, but we've received the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And so banish fear. Fear will rob us of our faith. Fear will starve us of our, our futures that we will not accomplish because we're constantly stumbling because we're afraid. Now, we're not talking about fear of the dark or fear of another person with a weapon. We're talking about fear of ourselves not being good enough, not being more than we are being, not being who we should be, weakness and inability. The third area of battle, turn to Romans, uh, Revelation. You know, you don't need to turn to Revelation. It's Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Pastor Ray Beth already quoted it this morning. The, fir the third area of a battle in our mind is worthlessness and self-doubt. Worthlessness and self-doubt. So many people feel they just don't measure up in the eyes of God. Afraid to approach the Lord. Afraid to accept his love, his forgiveness. I don't deserve it. I'm not good enough. I can't be who he's called me to be. To be. Now, we, we see these, this feeling, this battle, uh, in some of my favorite characters that I mention all the time, Gideon, for example, or Moses, for example, over and over trying to convince God that he's made a mistake, that they're not the ones that he's calling to do what he's called them to do. And much of the people today have that same sense that they just don't have self-worth in the eyes of the Lord or in the eyes of others. And one of the reactions of that is a bitterness in our heart. We become bitter. And the bitterness is not because other people have necessarily hurt us or done something to us. It's because we're expecting them to because we're worthless. That is a masked feeling on the inside of our heart. The enemy doesn't try to do anything straight. It's always darkness and covered and under layers and layers of subterfuge. And so we have this bitterness. And so we, we look at people critically and dislike people and find fault with people who are successful or are seemingly successful just because they're content. And we're not. And we constantly feel that we don't have enough, won't have enough, can't be enough, can't get where we want to get to, can't be what we want to be because we are not worthy of it. Not because we don't have ability, not because we don't have the, the open doors, it's just we're not worthy. Self-worth. And again, that's a multi-billion dollar industry today. And the enemy, as Pastor Ray Beth quoted, it's in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, is called the accuser of the brethren. He is constantly accusing us, accusing us of not being worthy, of not being good enough, of not knowing enough, of not praying enough. Have you ever, ever been caught in that trap where you feel like you're not praying enough? Now, generally speaking, we're not praying enough. But let's say you just prayed for several hours, intercessory prayer, and you feel like you just haven't prayed enough. The enemy wants you to feel unable, unloved, and that your prayers, no matter how much you pray, it's not enough. That you get in this trap of praying, and you're praying because you feel like you're not praying enough. He's the accuser. He wants to accuse us of anything that he can. The accuser of the brethren who accuses us before the Lord day and night. The accuser doesn't rest. The scripture says in Revelation, day and night. He is constantly accusing us. He accuses us of things we've been forgiven from as well. You know, the Lord, when, when we ask him to forgive us, he forgets. It's cast into his sea of forgetfulness. But we remember, and so does the enemy, and constantly accuses us of things we've already repented of and be forgiven, been forgiven of. But we know our past, and so that's why you'll hear so many people saying we're just filthy rags, we're good for nothing. That feeds into the enemy's line. No, we are the righteousness of Christ once we've been born again. Once we're washed in the blood, we're no longer clothed in filthy rags. We are the righteousness of Christ. We are weaponized. We are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We've got to begin to think like that and think that we are able, we've been called, we've been anointed, we've been chosen by the Lord himself. 
So he's equipped us with weapons. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, we want to look at what we do about it. Those are the three battlefields. How do, we, how do we handle these battles? What's our strategy? Successful warfare is always following successful strategy. Generals in ancient warfare would survey the battlefield first for days before the battle was engaged in order to judge the, the plane. I'll give you a real quick example from ancient history. You've all heard of Alexander the Great. Well, Alexander the Great invaded the Persian Empire, and the Persian king Darius, he had war chariots. He had thousands of war chariots, and he equipped them with scythes on the wheels. You've probably seen that in some Roman movies, where you have these swords on the wheels, that when they turn, they would slice anybody nearby. Now, the war chariots were like the tanks of today. Anyway, they went to the battlefield days ahead of the battle, and uh, it was a long, broad plain that, that was perfect for chariots. But every once in a while, there were little bumps and little hills. So he had his engineers go dig all those and flatten them. He had them flatten the entire battlefield. Anywhere there was a bump, anywhere there was a slight hill, he had them completely alter the battlefield so it would be absolutely flat so he could achieve his strategy. It didn't work, though. He didn't achieve his strategy. But that was his, that was his strategy. He, was, he had a strategy. Now, Alexander had a better strategy, so Alexander won that battle. But anyway, our strategy in, Colossians, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to look at one verse. It's verse 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed. The problem is that we spent most of our lives thinking the way we were thinking. And it became a habit. It became a pattern. The old man thinking became a pattern. So if we grew up thinking that we're not good enough and reinforced by maybe somebody in our life telling us you're not good enough, you're never going to amount to anything, then we believe that. And we began to think along those and then everything from that point on, we began to judge by that way of thinking. Our starting point for thinking was not... What a day. Let's see what I can do today. But our starting point each and every day was another day. And I'm not going to be able to get through this unless I hit the bottle or take a pill or do some other thing. That thinking can be changed. The entire thought process can be changed, can be altered. And he says very clearly that we renew our mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit here, not talking about our spirit, talking about the way we think. How do we renew the way we think? We begin to think thoughts that God has said. We begin to think, first of all, I will be with you, is what he told Moses, what he told Gideon, what he told others, uh, uh, Elijah, I will be with you. I will be with you. Is God with us? When we're born again, is he then with us? So if he is with us, then he thinks more highly of us than we may. So we begin to renew our mind based on the fact that God is with us. If he's with us, then he gives us ability and power. Part of that ability and power, you know, we can lay hands on the sick and they can recover. We can command the enemy. How about taking control of our mind and not allowing thoughts of worthlessness, not allowing thoughts of inability, not allowing thoughts of bitterness, not allow allowing thoughts of putting others down and looking for faults in them to make ourselves feel better. But we begin to think thoughts of greatness. Now you might say, oh, Pastor Frank, what do you mean thoughts of greatness? Thoughts like Jesus would think. Thoughts of greatness. What can we do for the kingdom of God? You know, uh, wasn't it John F. Kennedy who said, ask not what your country can do for you, which is basically what everybody's asking today, isn't it? But ask what you can do for your country. Ask not what the kingdom of God can do for you, but ask what you can do for the kingdom of God. 
It's time that we believe and understand that God is with us with reason and purpose. Not just because we're another flower in the field that he wants to have in heaven. But there's reason and purpose for our salvation. Reason and purpose for our existence. Reason and purpose for our healing, for our miracle. Reason and purpose for his baptism. There's reason and purpose for everything the Lord has done for us and in us and to us, which is beyond us feeling good. But that in itself should make us feel good about ourselves. So he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, a companion verse with that is Colossians chapter 3. We're going to turn to real quickly. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Lie not one to another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds. If we've truly put off the old man, we're not thinking like the old man then. We've put him off. We're not using those old thoughts and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. How do we renew our mind? By drawing closer to the Lord, getting to know him more. How do we get to know him more? Through his Bible, through his word. We renew our mind by getting to know the Lord more, better, understanding who he is, what he wants, what he does, what he's done. How he leads, how he guides, what he says, how he speaks, how he moves. How do we see how he does that? Look at Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of his Bible, his word. The embodiment of his word. What Jesus does, what Jesus says, who Jesus is, is who we are to be because he tells us if we say we abide in him, we should walk like he walked in the same way. He went about doing good and healing all that were sick or oppressed of the devil, which means he wasn't focused on self all the time, was he? He was focused on others. He was ministering to others. He was freely giving what he had received from God the Father. When we take our attention away from ourselves and begin to give, begin to seek, the Lord opens the windows of heaven and blesses us. Seek the kingdom first and all other things will be added unto you, he said, didn't he? The second area of uh, strategy is to stay in him. I would go back to Isaiah 26. You will keep him in perfect peace. A mind that's at peace is not double-minded. If we're double-minded, what does James say? We're unstable in all our ways. Unstable in our faith, unstable in our walk, unstable in our church attendance, unstable in our, 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 our relationships, unstable in our finances, unstable in all our ways. Stability can begin with solid, peaceful mind. Single-minded. Single-minded. He will keep him in perfect peace. A mind that is at peace is not wishy-washy, but confident. Well, I hope he hears my prayer. I hope he answers. I, 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 I don't know, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, let's see what happens. That's all wishy-washy. We are to be confident in him. Cast not away your confidence, Hebrews tells us. So we are to be single-minded people of faith that our mind... See, what, what happens? Faith comes from the heart, right? And tonight, by the way, we're going to be talking about the battle for the heart. This morning, it's battle for the mind. This evening, battle for the heart. Faith comes from the heart. But our mind betrays us. Our mind undercuts us. Our mind convinces us that that faith that's in the heart is not operational. It sounds good. Sounds wonderful. We're blessed to hear it in church on Sunday. But when we get out there on the street, it doesn't work. Out there, you've got to use your street smarts. Because your faith doesn't work out there. It's a great sounding thing. It worked for Jesus and some of the apostles, but you know, it's, it's passed away with the early church. It's gone. It was dispensational to get the church started. And then the Lord said, okay, church, you're on your own now. I'm going back to heaven and we're having a party and you just muddle through life and try to figure it out. Basically, that's what these others are saying. I see in my Bible that the Holy Spirit empowers the church. The church began with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that 
power changes us and those around us. He says, he will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. Now, that is a great opportunity for your mind to be stayed on me. Right? That's a great opportunity. When you have outbursts like that, that's when two dogs meet, three dogs meet. When you have that, when you have that, stay focused. I can keep preaching through anything, I'm telling you. I, um, I remember a story Kenneth Copeland taught. Now, Kenneth Copeland, you know, when you think of Kenneth Copeland, you think, you know, multi-zillionaire and millions of people all around the world know him, and he preaches, he's got jets. Jet. When he first started, he was asked to preach a dinner meeting, one of his first places he preached. And uh, so he's at the pulpit, only they didn't realize... Basement Fellowship Hall, yeah. And uh, he's, he's, but they didn't tell him that he was going to be preaching during the dinner. He thought, we're going to eat, and then he's going to preach, because, you know, he's the preacher. And so he's at the pulpit preaching, and the waiters and waitresses are down, you know, going back and forth between him and the people, and the people are chowing down, and they're praying over their food, and they're eating, and they're, you know, talking at their tables, and he's up there preaching. That was his first experience. Pastor Cho in Korea. His first time preaching. The Lord told him to rent a hall in South Korea in Seoul. And, and he rented this hall, maybe seated three, four hundred people. And he put it, bought all this advertising, posters all over the city, radio ads. He was, he was all set. Comes time for the meeting. He's there early, you know, he's praying in the back. He looks out, there's nobody there. So he's praying, he's praying. Fifteen minutes to go, nobody's there. Time for service, nobody's there. So he's praying, and he's just praying, and he's praying. He prays until 30 minutes after the service was supposed to start, and nobody showed up, not a single person. So he quietly turned the lights out, locked the door, shut the door, and he left. He's on his way home, and the Lord stopped him and said, Cho, what are you doing? Where are you going? He says, well, Lord, I'm going home. And the Lord says, why are you going home? He said, because nobody showed up. And the Lord, and this is, Pastor Cho says this, and the Lord said, I told you to preach. I didn't say anybody was going to show up. So he turned around, he went back, turned the lights on, preached his whole message to nobody. Now, as we know, for many, many, many years, probably, I'm not sure if he still is, had the largest church in the world. You know, had millions in the church. I mean, just to let alone his deacons, the deacons of the church, 50,000 deacons which is pretty amazing. Anyway, so focus. That's all to bring you back to focus. I, ever since Rob said that about a joke, I've had a joke that I wanted to tell. It was from, it was from Ken. It's Ken's fault. It's Ken's fault. Ken, Ken sent me a joke. It was from Ronald Reagan, actually. Ronald Reagan told this joke. And uh, I, he sent me a little video of Ronald Reagan telling this joke. And it was... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell it, since I've already... There is a, uh, a senator, U.S. senator, and a uh, pastor that happened to find themselves in the same hospital room. And they chatted back and forth. Um, they were both quite ill. And amazingly, they both passed away the same night in the same hospital room. And um, they, they, praise the Lord, the, the pastor made sure the senator was saved. So they're... They're on their way to heaven together. And they get up to heaven, they're together. And so, um, of course, in your typical joke, St. Peter meets him there. Uh, he must be a pretty busy man in heaven because he meets everybody, apparently. So he, he says, uh, let me show you to your quarters. And he takes the, the, uh, the, the pastor and he takes him to a very humble, small home. And this is, your, this is your place in heaven for eternity. And the pastor says, well, thank you, thank you. And he goes in. And then he takes the, the, the senator and he takes him to this huge mansion. I mean, expansive, several stories, beautiful. And he says, and this is your home for eternity. And the, uh, the senator says, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. Can I ask you a question? He said, that man that came up with me, that pastor, he's been serving you all of his life. He, he represented you in the earth preaching, brought many people to faith. How come... He has that hovel, and I just got saved, and I get this mansion. And 
Peter looks at him and says, we have thousands of pastors here, but you're the first senator we ever got. Anyway, thank you, Ronald Reagan. So Isaiah 26, verse 3, you'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed. Stayed means you're not going anywhere. You're staying put. You're staying. You're focused on him. You're focused. You see, all the distractions, that was a distraction a little while ago. These distractions want to get your focus off of him. And this is what the enemy will do. That was actually planned. That was an object lesson that we planned for you that to show you how easily it is, how easy it is to be distracted. Thank you very much. I appreciate your help. It was to show you. What, you don't believe me? <laughs> well, it fits. But it's so easily we're distracted each and every day. And he says, stay the course. Stayed on him. Focused on him. Because in the world, what will you have, Jesus said? Tribulation. What does that mean? Angst. You'll have all kinds of confusion and chaos. You'll have fear and doubt. You'll have all of that stuff that they're involved in. But in him, he'll have peace. I will keep him in perfect peace. When you have perfect peace, you know this is the way I'm walking it. When you have perfect peace, you know this is what he said. I'm believing it. When you have perfect peace, you say this is what I'm saying. That mountain's moving. That's peace. You'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because we trust him. That's the bottom line. If we want to win the battle of our mind, we bring it to the place where we trust God. All of us have had trust broken. People break their word. People break hearts. We lose trust in people. We lose trust in churches. We lose trust in pastors. Don't ever lose trust in God. Restore that trust. He is trustworthy. He will never betray us. He will never abandon us. He will never leave us. His word remains forever. And that's the bottom line. When we trust him, we'll act like him. When we trust him, we'll believe him. When we trust him, we'll have that peace. When we trust him, we'll stay in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.